This is hands down my favorite subject in the entire Bible, typology or Jesus in the Old Testament. It is like the most brilliant and beautiful and blessing filled. I didn't mean to make alliteration there, but it is blessing filled area of study. It's so personally rewarding to me that as I do this kind of study, what we're going to talk about today, I am I'm just drawn to worship the Lord. I'm also drawn into seeing the incredible intelligence that there is behind scripture and how God's hand throughout history has been divinely moving and shaping things so that we would see who Jesus is and how much God loves us. So the interview you're about to watch is me being interviewed by Micah Gunn on his podcast, Apologetics Canada, where they're gonna, we're going to talk about the topic of Jesus in the Old Testament. I hope that you are really blessed by this. I hope it stirs your heart. And if you want more on this issue, I'll put a playlist to my entire series on Jesus in the Old Testament down below. Oh, and you can check out Micah Gunn's information and his podcast, YouTube channel, all that down in the description below. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Truth Be Told. I am incredibly excited about today's episode. This is our second video interview, and I am joined by Mike Winger of the Bible Thinker podcast. This is the very first Theology and Apologetics podcast I've listened to. I'm so excited to be talking to Mike Winger today. Mike, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, I, you know, I just, uh, basically, I'm a pastor in Southern California. I started doing teaching that I put online. I would cover either verse by verse teaching or like hot topics, issues that we need a lot of discernment and wisdom on, whether it's apologetics to defend the truth of Christianity, dealing with atheist claims, or if it's um, giving evidence for the Bible, or if it's dealing with things like Catholicism or the Hebrew roots movement, or you know, what about the Bible and tattoos, or just you name the issue. Um, and God's really blessed it, it's grown. I mean, we just recently passed 200,000 subscribers wow. on YouTube. And which just blows my mind. It's bigger than I was ever thinking it might actually be. And I'm excited to get to have the impact and get to, you know, hear from guys like you who are like, hey, this has impacted my life in a really positive way. It's as a as a pastor who's very content to teach like 10 people, this is just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's such a good project you're you're doing. And uh, you mentioned the uh, evidence for the Bible series that you did. That I mean, it's like one of the first ones that I discovered and it just, it changed everything for me. So I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I think every, everybody should, should go check out that one. Today, however, we are going to be talking about typology specifically and even more specifically typology of Christ, which is just so, so valuable. So this is an exciting topic. Um, and I know it's one that you're passionate about as well. So I'm oh, excited yeah. to have this discussion. Oh, yeah. So, So what is typology for our people that don't know what it is? All right. Well, you guys are familiar with, you know, probably the listeners familiar with different ologies like theology, whatever. So ology means the study of and then whatever pre precedes that is the thing you're studying. And so theology, well, theo means God. So that's the study of God. And typology is the study of types. But that is so vague. <laughs> it's so not helpful to use that term. Later, you'll start using it a lot. But at first, you're like, what are you talking about? So basically a type, to put it crudely, but I think in a way that just clicks, is it's something in the Old Testament that has intentional similarities to something in the New Testament. So it could be a person, a building, an activity. Um, more organically, I could, I could put it this way. Uh, God uses real lives, events, and things in the ancient past as a way of telling the story of Jesus ahead of time. So that when you get to the big reveal, you get excited to go back and rewatch the movie so to speak, to find all these Easter eggs throughout the Old Testament, ways that God has shown and hidden the, the truth of who Jesus is so that you'll see the entire Bible speaks of Jesus. You know, a good, a good illustration of this is those movies you have to watch twice. So one example, and whether people have seen it or not, they're at least familiar with it. It became kind of a pop culture thing. The I see dead people yeah. <laughs> moment. At any rate, you know, you watch the movie and you, and if you've, if you've seen it, you find out that, um, you know, Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. Right. And that's the big reveal. Now in the movie, you felt like you watched him interacting with people and doing things. And you're like, but wait a minute, but the dead people in this, in this fantasy story world, they don't do that. But when you rewatch the film, you realize they were very careful all the way along to be consistent so that you'd be like, how did I not see that? And I think that's what happens with Jesus in the Old Testament. You see, Jesus goes, hey, the, you know, Moses wrote of me, right? The, in the volume of the book, it's written of me. And then you see the reveal of who Jesus is. You look back at the Old Testament and you're like, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. And it gets very exciting. There's people, there's events, institution themes. Um, a, a, a word other than type in English, a word that might help even more is the word shadow. And that's what Hebrews 10 verse one uses. It says that the law has a shadow 
of the good things to come that are fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus is um, seen as the one who, who is reflecting the shadow, casting the shadow back at the Old Testament. I like that analogy. I think it's helpful for me. A shadow looks a lot like the person, but it's not the person. Right. So look for things in the Old Testament that look like Jesus. Yeah. The, the thing that always uh, kind of solidified that idea of types and then then also archetypes as well, which is the other the other term is um, almost like a stamp and then it, the rubber stamp itself and then the imprint that that leaves. One is the type and one is the archetype. And that that always did it. Shadow is very good as well. I like that. You you mentioned um, that you said specifically the wording you used was, was kind of funny just for kind of what we're covering here. You said a good illustration of this and something I came across when, when studying typology is people getting really, really um, off on things like, well, those are just illustrations. Those aren't actually types. Yeah. So what would you, what would you say to people that you would point out a certain set of typology and they would say, no, no, these are just illustrations. And what's the difference between the two of those things? Some people take the idea of typology, like I'm going to look for these sort of, okay, so so Moses is a, to give people another example, this, mm-hmm. Moses is like a deliverer for the people of Israel. He takes him out of the land of Egypt. They reject him the first time. They accept him the second time. That's like the people of, of, of the Jews who reject Jesus at his first coming, but they will be receiving him at his second. You know, there's um, there's there's a type of Christ. Uh, Moses brought them the law, but grace and truth came through Christ. There is a comparison between the two. Moses is the one who can go up mm-hmm. and access God and come down and bring the truth of God to people. Jesus is the one who is God himself coming down. All these are relations. Now, the thing about this is that it, you can become recklessly creative, right? <laughs> you start you start imagining types everywhere. And you see this sometimes when people try to find Jesus in the book of, say, Psalms. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they just go way off the reservation and you're like, that doesn't come from the text. That comes from your imagination. Now, some people go, we have to protect ourselves from falsely identifying types for two reasons. One, we don't just want to mishandle the word. And two, some people use types to teach bad theology. Mm-hmm. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, they teach the Mariology of the church and they tie it to typology. Mary is the Ark of the Covenant that contains mm-hmm. the word of God. Okay, so there's all these types and you're like, hey, that kind of works. And so you think maybe Mariology is true because of typology. So how do you protect against this? Well, you say, okay, types are only things that are specifically identified in the New Testament as a type, right? When the New Testament says Jesus is like a greater Moses. Okay. So Moses is a type. When it says the bronze serpent must be lifted up. So the son of man must be lifted up. Okay. So the bronze serpent is a type, is a shadow. Um, When you, uh, when you say that Jesus is our Passover. Okay. So the Passover is a type of Christ, but you don't, you, you don't go any further. You, you never look beyond whatever, you know, say there's a hundred types in the New Testament specifically identified from the old. You never go beyond that. There's not a hundred one. There's no extra ones you can look for. And this is like a safety measure. Protect you from bad theology, protect you from fabricating teachings about the scripture. Um, I think that this is a mistake. <laughs> I think for a few different reasons. I think there's a better rule. Here's my rule for typology. Um, there's way more types than what is specifically identified in the New Testament. I think that is obvious, and I think it's strange when people argue otherwise, my, mm-hmm. my honest opinion there. Here's a better rule. Typology doesn't give us theology. It comes from our theology. And then you can't use typology to fabricate new teachings because it's the fact that the New Testament reveals these truths about Jesus that gives me the justification to find those throughout the Old Testament. And I don't see that teaching about Mary, for instance, in the New Testament. So why would I be looking for a type of it in the old? Because there is no anti-type. There is no corresponding, you know, thing reflecting the shadow. So, um, so in my, in my opinion, the type versus illustration types are whatever the New Testament calls a type illustrations are whatever else you come up with. (laughs) I think that that is artificial. And there's even times where like, look at Joseph. Joseph is an incredible type of Christ, but the camp who says it's not identified in the New Testament as a type, therefore it's not a type, they would have to deny that Joseph is a type of Christ. Like he's a son who comes late, who's hated by his brothers because of his dream that they're going to bow down to him, that he'll be their Lord. He is sold into slavery. He is sold just like Judas sold Jesus. Um, They believe him to be dead. He's considered dead for a long time. During that time, while they have rejected him and he's considered to be dead. They don't think he's alive, even though he really is. There's an interesting connection to Jesus. (laughs) Um, He saves the world. 
right? He, he raises up into Egypt, becomes the right hand of Pharaoh, and he becomes a, a savior for the world because he gives them what? Bread when they're starving. Jesus is like, I'm the true bread, right? So there's this amazing connections. He's finally reconciled to his brothers and his family when they repent. And then says, you know, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. And all this, and there's way more, right? All this looks so much like Jesus, but these people would say, that's not really a type because the New Testament doesn't say it's a type. And I'll be like, well, the New Testament says the bronze serpent is a type. And that's way less like numbers of corresponding images yeah. to Jesus. Right. And and then it makes me think too, when, when Christ explains to his disciples about the Old Testament and how it applies to him, they are amazed. And you, you got to imagine, he's not saying, oh, there's these like six or seven times I mentioned. It's like, no, it says that the Old Testament is about him. You know, the, the writings of Moses were about him. And um, I think we can limit ourselves too much, I think, and and stop almost stop studying, you know, this amazing thing that that connects the Old and the New Testament together through the person of Jesus. Like that, if we just stop at a certain number and say, well, that's all there is. It's like, man, yeah. if you think that's all that Jesus said to his disciples at the time when they were just blown away with all that he said regarded him, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. Yeah, I think I think we are. And that's what gets so exciting is I'm digging into it. Now, in my series, I try to do this in a sober fashion because some people get so excited to find typology that they they stretch things and you start to go like, man, that's really, really stretching. Actually, I don't I don't mind if you have something that you feel like this could be a type. I'm not sure. Let's just talk about it. It's fun mm -hmm. to talk about it. It's fun to look at it and think about it. But I would just say, you know, lower your confidence mm -hmm. to an appropriate level. So it's okay to say, for instance, um, is Samson a type of Christ? Boy, he sure seems like a strange type. If he is, if you want to try to make a correspondence, don't like say this, he's a type just as surely as the bronze serpent is, right. um, just, you know, it's okay to have this journey, this like wonderful adventure, but with these sort of safeguards of wisdom and, and integrity about how strongly we'll lean on our conclusions. Yeah. Right. And I think what you said too, about our theology dictates where the type is, the types don't dictate our theology is important because that allows so much safety. When you're looking at someone like Samson, you say, okay, where, where can I find Christ in the old Testament? And you might look at the person of Samson and say, ah, that's, that seems like a stretch, but he did do this good thing. He did deliver Israel. So maybe in a, in some way and seeing Christ in the old Testament is not a wrong thing. But if you then let that dictate your theology and what you believe and change so drastically what you believe, then you might be in hot water pretty quick because exactly. it's a human need just to, I don't know, maybe not a need, but a desire to be like, Oh, I learned something that people don't get. It's the secret thing. And it's some, the cool thing about typology is it feels that way. Like this, incredible, intricate nature that the Bible has. And you see, wow, this is unfolding before me. And yet it's outlined in the New Testament as very legitimate, very valid. And that's, I think that's the beauty of this is it just makes it so, so cool to study into. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's other people that will say things like, well, evidence of typology would actually lead to people saying that, well, there was collusion in the Bible because these, these people wanted, um, to appear as if they, they were connected. You know, these apostles wouldn't appear that their story was connected to the Old Testament. And so um, maybe they they kind of forged some of this in. They exaggerated. Um, I know that specifically has been a hot topic among scholars, exaggeration of the gospel message. Uh, what, what would you say to those people that, I mean, besides the fact that obviously it's written about in the New Testament where Jesus says, these were written about me. Yeah. What confidence could you give to someone? Well, I want to tell them they're on the right track. <laughs> it, it is collusion. That's the, that is true. The question is, is it collusion merely from the minds of the New Testament authors who are shaping the life of Christ? So it looks a lot like Moses and Solomon and David and the feasts of Israel. And, and you just go on and on and on and on and on. Are they, I mean, this would be, let's just be honest. This would be a very laborious and very careful thing to try to make it look not just like one Old Testament person or event, but so many. This is a this is really big. But this assumes a few things, right? This assumes that they have the liberty to actually change the story of Jesus that drastically. It also assumes that that there's a way to make a character that looks like all these Old Testament things at the same time. Like the fact that there is, when you take you take all these pillar moments and people and events in the in the Old Testament, and when you can construct a narrative of a, of a single person's life out of that, that itself is impressive. And the New Testament authors couldn't make that a reality. 
Um, the challenge I would give for people is do this with somebody else. Like really go ahead and do this with somebody else. And then, and then, cause you, you'll be able to, but <laughs> let's compare the quality. Cause as soon as we start looking, we go, Oh, you have two correspondences to Moses. You have three correspondences to David. And I'm like, no, there's like 30 and there's like 40. <laughs> it just, it's so above and beyond. Uh, but it's also kind of naive. The people who have these sort of conspiratorial theories about the Bible often are, are, just very unaware of, of actual, and I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be rude or, or like mightier or wiser than other people, Sure. but this is what I discovered when I first heard these kinds of claims as a younger person, <clears throat> it didn't occur to me that you might actually have to like have evidence for a claim like that. So the gospel authors colluded, they made and shaped the story of Jesus to fit these other stories. Okay. But where's your evidence of that? Um, Right? Do you need you need evidence for this, don't you? Or is you only need evidence for Christian claims? But <laughs> that's what it seems like. <laughs> require no evidence. It's a, they're all blind, taken on blind faith. So here are some historical facts about Jesus. Because the question I want us to ask is this: Is the story of Jesus moldable and shapeable by the New Testament authors in such a way that they can make it look like it connects to the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament was definitely written before they showed up. They can't change that, <laughs> right? And they don't. If you think they changed the Old Testament, you're really unaware of yeah. this. Um, so. The, uh, the New Testament authors, well, if you look at what a historian who does not believe the Bible as God's word, what they believe to be facts about Jesus's life, we have things like Jesus was a real person. Jesus really had disciples. He really was from Nazareth. He also um, did something like miracles. At least he had a reputation of being a great miracle worker. That's not fabricated. Mm -hmm. That's He had this real reputation. He was crucified. He was crucified at Passover. That's significant because that's a type as well, Passover. Mm -hmm. His crucifixion at Passover was not made up by the disciples. That's like a historic fact. You, you could study atheist historians who would agree with the same reality. And the empty tomb. So everything else I've shared has been a um, consensus among scholars, like over 90, well over 90% of scholars, even atheists would say this. The empty tomb, there's at least a, a strong majority. Used to be a great minority 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but it's been growing and growing. Scholarship's more and more moving towards, over the past 20, 30 years, towards the belief that the empty tomb is like a real thing. So we have a death, a disciples, miracles, a, a, a resurrection, or at least a believed resurrection. They're not fabricating this, right? This is something that actually happened. We have the rejection by the chief priests. We have the crucifixion by the, the Romans, all this kind of thing. This stuff, here's the thing. These are all elements that are important in the typology. So you have immovable realities of Jesus's life, unchangeable statements in the Old Testament. And this is what the typology is being based on. So the New Testament authors can't have just made it up. Now you could accuse them of tweaking details, but now you need evidence for that too. Even the, even the authors themselves, even the disciples, when, when Jesus died, they fled and they gave up. It was their belief that they'd seen the risen Christ that caused them to have faith and trust in Jesus, that sort of thing. So all this to say this, when, when you look at say Isaiah 53, say, say Psalm 22, here's a typological passage. It's a prophecy, but it's also typological because David speaks of himself and he describes a crucifixion hundreds of years before crucifixion is invented. Now, Jesus historically was really crucified. He's also a son of David. He was even proclaimed to be the Messiah. It's the, the, the king of the son of David. That's why mm -hmm. he was crucified. These are just historical immovable facts. So the correspondence between Jesus and Psalm 22 doesn't even depend on the gospel authors. It depends on a historic fact. Jesus was crucified. What we know of crucifixion based on external historical reports and just seeing the connection. So these are, um, <clears throat> anyway, all that to say, it's, it's, a little, it's a little naive to think the gospel authors had this kind of wholesale invention going on. And even to think if they did do it, that it would correspond with this many details of the Old Testament. Yeah, that, that is such a good point. And it's interesting. I, I think it's really important for Christians to uh, understand that when people make claims like that, they they have to back it up. It, it isn't just on Christians to support their claims. Naysayers and, and naturalists or historians, whatever, whatever you are, whoever you're speaking with, they have to back up a claim. That's not just for us to do. So it, it often doesn't feel that way, but it's really, really important for Christians, I think, to remember that. And I'm glad you brought up Psalm uh, Psalm 22 as well, because earlier you said something about um, people will find typology in the Psalms or something. And I thought you were mm -hmm. saying that it's not there. And I was like, man, Psalm 22, though, you've spoken oh, yeah. about no, it's that. There. Yeah. Yeah, it's there. It's there. It's sometimes, though, um, like there's been guys who teach through the Bible and they feel like it's their job to find Jesus in every verse. 
every verse. And so this create creates a situation where they're forced to be very creative to find Jesus in every single verse yeah. of the Bible. It feels pious because you feel like you really love Jesus because he's in every verse, except I don't know a justification that every like sentence has to have some sort of representation of Christ in it. Right. It's okay if God just says something. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's all right. Um, so begats. yeah, I, I would say some people go too far with it. Yeah. Or the, the begats. You you have he begat him, he begat him, begat him. It's like, yeah, that, that does eventually become important in Christ's genealogy. But I mean, how can you how can you make that? You know, th yeah. there's so little theological content in the begats. It's just a genealogy. So to, yeah. to try and I don't know, find theology in that would be pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Respect the Bible enough to let it say what it wants to say and not come at it with an agenda there ahead of time. But what we see in scripture is this just amazing storytelling. So um, I've, I've been studying storytelling a little bit recently. This is this is a side project of mine <laughs> for various reasons. Right? I'm studying like the nature of storytelling. And one of the things that, that they do is something that's called symmetry. And you see it in stories all the time. Um, from the beginning of, to this, of the story to the end, they'll usually start and end at the same, often at the same location, yet the world has changed by the end. So the location, it, everything's normal and happy. Okay, you have the garden, you have, you have Adam and Eve, and they, the fall happens. But, and then in Revelation, we have the restoration of that relationship. Even the tree of life is seen in Revelation again. Mm -hmm. you have, here's a type for us. Adam is, represents all of us. It, he federally represents you and me. And, and what do we get? We get a, a tree is the source of this. He eats of a tree and crowns of uh, crowns, sorry, uh, thorns are a result of this suffering and death. And Jesus, he's crowned with thorns. He's hung on a tree and he dies for us. Why? Because he represents us all just like Adam represents us all in the garden, except he is now here in the garden of Gethsemane and where Adam yielded to temptation, Jesus will not. Where Adam ate of the tree, Jesus went to be fixed to the tree. Like the, and you think of that, that fruit he ate as representing sin. Well, Jesus, he becomes sin for us on the cross. Like all these parallels are there. And you might think, well, you're, you're making that happen, Mike. And I'm just like, you're not paying attention, man. There's <laughs> like, you know, it, when there's, um, when there's enough correspondence, enough points of correspondence between one thing and another, you, you, you have to see a connection. There's a purposeful connection here. And then when the historical details tell you they couldn't have made all this up, like it's not possible. Yeah. Then it means somebody else was behind this. And that person had to have actually controlled history to make this stuff take place. And yeah. I'm just like, yeah, this is what we call Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and even if you said, okay, let's say 60% of it, you know, let's, let's just go through one story where you think there's typology of Christ there. Even if 60% of it is spot on and 40% is not, that is still you know, nothing to, to shy away from. That's something to look closer at. And it almost feels like you have to have a, a bit of a willing, a willful ignorance to, to not see some of this. Not, not to say that some people just are like, yeah, that one felt like a stretch to me or not to say various ones people might not see as readily, just knowledge wise, or uh, maybe their level of understanding is just a little bit different, but yeah. to not see any of it is that's, it seems willful to me at that point. Yeah. I, I think it's impressive. And, um, I, I will say also this, like if, cause I I've, I've had skeptics challenge me <clears throat> on the typology stuff saying, you know, you can, and I don't usually use typology to try to preach the gospel or to show that Christianity is true only sure. because I don't think people have the patience to walk through hours and hours of examples. But if they do, I think it's very convincing. Um, so I try to give shorter, quicker things, but mm -hmm. But a skeptic pushed back and was like, yeah, but I could find, I could do that with somebody else. And so again, I, as I issued earlier, my challenge is do it, try it. I want you to see how hard it is and yeah. how easy it is with Jesus. And um, so people who've tried this is like Joseph Smith or Muhammad, or people try it with their lives, mm -hmm. right? With Muhammad, let's find Muhammad in the Bible. And it's really bad. And they have like two places they go and they're terrible out of context. With, with Joseph Smith, you can't find him anywhere. There's this statement in the Bible where it says the stick of Joseph. And it's, it's, it's referencing, uh, the tribes of Israel as mm -hmm. the descendants of Joseph. It's nothing to do with Joseph Smith. They just have the word Joseph there or, or Joseph Smith actually went so far as to start to write extra, uh, passages into the end of Genesis, literally in his, in his own Bible version, he, and you've probably seen this video where I talk about this, but he actually wrote an extra chapter of, of info in Genesis where he writes a prophecy about himself catch this. It's so hard to find anything you want in here <laughs> like that, that he has to rewrite it. This to me bolsters the case that Jesus is throughout the, the New Testament and Old 
because of the inspiration of God and not the invention of man. So um, I, I just want to real quick go through um, a, a little more. I just basically I'm just going to throw up a few scriptures to show that the Bible specifically says this is valid, and that would be in First Peter three verse twenty one. Uh, the type and antitype of, of baptism and the flood during Noah's time in John 3.14, which you already, already covered, is a serpent lifted up. And then in Luke 24, this is post-resurrection, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He said, Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is Jesus Christ explaining to his disciples, who are probably yeah. amazed. I would have loved to be there for that specific teaching from Christ because, wow. But this is not something we're making up here. So before we get into specific examples of typology, I, I'm hoping you're, you'll go through a few with us. Um, I just want to start with that foundation of this is what typology is. Yes, people have things to say against it, but it's really unfounded, and the Bible itself speaks to this being a, a true study. So that I just wanted to get through that, but I, I really would like to spend the remainder of our time going through types of Christ so, so people can see just how awesome this study can be, if, if you would uh, be so kind. Um, we, we get this pattern in the book of Acts ch chapter 7, where Stephen is about to be martyred, and he gives the Jews a history lesson. It's a really long chapter where before he's killed by them, he gives them a history lesson. And he's like, over and over again, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase. He goes, we, God sends us deliverers and we reject them over and over again. This happens. And so what you can do is you could say, here's Stephen under the leading of the spirit, giving us a pattern that we could look for in the old Testament. And um, no, another one of the people who that happens to is David. David is ultimately God's chosen King. Solomon, uh, Saul, excuse me, is, is yeah, God picked him to be the king to teach the people a lesson, but David's like the man after his own heart. David is very much a type of Christ. They even call Jesus the son of David. Like that's his, even though, right, he, his, he wasn't a direct son of David, but he was of the lineage. So he's called the son of David. Son of David was just a title for the Messiah. And so David is, he's anointed in secret away from the king. He's anointed by the spiritual leadership. He's, he's not anointed or approved of by the um, by the people who are running the tabernacle directly. He's not approved of by the king or the leaders of the land, just like Jesus, right? He's anointed God, you know, John the Baptist out in the wilderness, and that's it. Um, he's God's chosen king, just like Jesus is God's chosen king. He's rejected by the people and actually hunted by Saul, who tries to throw spears at him to try to kill him. So he suffers persecution. David then runs out. And where does he go? He goes to the Gentiles and he gets Gentile followers. And they and, and, um, and among also the riffraff, the, the, the cast off who people don't care about, they become his followers. This is very much like the early church. It was like the riffraff and the Gentiles, the, the, the lowbrow Jews, not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the respectable people. And so they become his followers, but later on, eventually he becomes installed as their king. Now there's tons of things in David's life, like Psalm 22, um, that you can look at to be more detailed pictures, but you see that just the overall course of his life is like a pattern. Another guy with the same pattern is Jephthah in the book of Judges. He's one of my favorite pictures. I don't know why. I just really <laughs> like the way he pictures Christ. So in the book of Judges, we read about Jephthah. You probably, a lot of people don't remember who he is, you know, and, and you read about him and he's the, he's the son of a prostitute. He is initially rejected by his people. His own brothers chase him away. And then where does he go? to the land of uh, Tob, where, which is out of outside of Israel, and he gets Gentile followers. And, and it describes his followers as worthless men started following him. <laughs> Imagine being <laughs> the disciples hearing that yeah. from Christ. <laughs> yeah. And um, so Jesus, obviously, is not the son of a prostitute, but his but his parentage, because the, the father was unknown to them. They didn't know it was the Lord. It was God uh, who, who impregnated her supernaturally. And so she's he's it's hinted out in the gospels that jesus is being accused of having a mom who cheated and slept around mm -hmm. um he's initially rejected by his own people he then the gospel goes out fine the jews reject it i'm going to the gentiles that's what paul says in, in the, the book of acts so he goes and the gentiles are just flooding in and receiving him and finally you know this is a cool part in jephthah finally his own people they're being oppressed and they reach out to him and they're like hey we see your your power we see your strength and we see your followers we now believe in you, 
right? Can you come back and deliver us from these people? And Jephthah lays out a, a rule. He says, if, if I come and deliver you, will I truly be your Lord? Hmm. And it's like, they have to agree to this. And to me, this is like exactly the appeal of Christ. He goes, I am here to deliver you. I'm strong to save, but will I be your Lord? Do you just want my help or do you want me? You know, and when you accept him relationally as your Lord, it's, it's, you know, that's the life-changing moment. That's I just think there's so powerful. many, oh man, here's another one. Um, and you guys are familiar with this Abraham offering Isaac um, in Genesis 22. It's like, what is going on with this passage? Oftentimes when people first read it, they're like, God told him to kill his son. Like that's insane. I, and, and, and it's usually things like that, that shock you in the Bible are supposed to get your attention. Here, what we see is a picture of the father offering his son. God so loved the world to gave his only son. When, when God speaks to Abraham, he goes, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Now, what's weird is this was not Abraham's only son. But for some reason, he's just called your only son. Okay, but Jesus is the only. And so this makes this, in other words, <laughs> the wording used with Abraham is more accurate about Jesus than it is about Abraham. And then he takes him to, a, to, to this Mount Moriah to sacrifice him there. And it's a three-day journey. And it's as though for three days, he had given up his son. He had decided, okay, I'm, I'm going I'm to sacrifice him. When, uh, when you realize that Mount Moriah is actually Jerusalem, this is Jerusalem. Abraham traveled to Jerusalem to, to draw a picture of a man offering his own son so that we would see the picture of Jesus being offered by the Father for our sins, even in the same location. And this is thousands of years ahead of time. And, and you can't tell me Jesus wasn't crucified at that location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like that's that wasn't made up guys and so abraham goes and he goes to offer the son and god stops him but, but before this happens though the son asks him he's like dad where's the offering and he says well god will provide the offering god will provide it and so remember that god will provide he goes to offer and god stops him and says there's a there's a ram caught in the thicket and so he offers the ram instead meaning that god's like i wanted you to draw this picture but I'm not going to make you go through with it because just like you're going, Oh Lord, please don't make him do this. God's like, I'm not going to make him do it. I want you to know that I did it. I just want you to understand the pain and the, and the difficulty and the hardship of me giving my own son for you. And so then Abraham says something that's really shocking. After he offers this animal, he says in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. What, what Mount and what it, this is, this is like, He's taking his experience and turning it into a prophetic statement about the future. And so in the Mount of the Lord, well, that's Mount Moriah. That this is in Jerusalem. It's one of the, one of the hilltops in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's here that it will be provided. What? Well, the only thing you have to correspond to it is the picture of a father offering his son. And I'm just like blown away. I'm going, do you guys realize this is Genesis, right? This is, this is Genesis. This is thousands of years before Jesus. This is before we have um, Isaiah 53, before we have Psalm 22, before we have a Zechariah and all these sort of more direct prophecies mm -hmm. about what Jesus will come and do for us. Here we have the picture of a father offering his son. I think this is just, it blows my mind. And if, and if they're, well, they crafted the story of Jesus to represent that. And I'm like, <laughs> no, dude, that's naive. Like Jesus happened. They're yeah. just looking back and going, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's an Easter egg. When you watch the movie the second time, you see it for what it is and you're blown away. Yeah. And we could go on and on. Um, the feasts of Israel are, they picture Christ, the actual feasts themselves, the whole Passover process. It, it, in, I go through great detail on, on my, on my video on the Passover and how it represents Jesus, but the whole Passover process represents Christ. And he died on Passover for Passover. One animal is selected to bear the, 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 the punishment that would come upon all the people. And the punishment is, would be on a firstborn son. So the idea is this animal represents a firstborn son. And Jesus is the firstborn son the, of the father to represent all of us. The, the idea of putting the blood on the lentils, the, the, the food that they would eat, everything about it, it has all these elements that lend themselves very easily and strongly to typology. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Um, or what about Mel Melchizedek? <laughs> yeah. So in Genesis, we, we have this little tiny passage about Melchizedek. In Psalms, he's mentioned again, and then that's pretty much it. So in Genesis, Melchizedek is this guy who's a priest and a king in Salem, which is very possibly Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem. It might be a different location. There's more than one city called Salem. Uh, so 
very possibly ancient Jerusalem. Even typologically, though, Salem meaning peace, like that. I, I didn't mean to jump there, but like oh, even no, if it's a different it. city or, or whatever, it, Salem, the city meaning peace, like just typologically, yeah. it's there already. Yeah. So this is this is not, you can't accuse me of making this up. Hebrews lays has a whole chapter, the book of Hebrews, on Melchizedek and how he is a type of Christ. So he in Melchizedek, uh, in the Old Testament passage, he comes and meets Abraham after Abraham had a great military victory against these uh, kidnappers uh, and murderers. And he beat them, these, these kings, he beat them. And then he's on his way back and he meets Melchizedek. Very little info here. Melchizedek gives him bread and wine and he gives a, t- a tithe, 10% of all that, all the spoils go to Melchizedek. Hebrews picks up on this, but oh, and then in Psalm 110, we have a prophecy that there's somebody coming in the future who will be a a, a king or a priest uh, like Melchizedek or a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Mm-hmm. And this is a messianic psalm. Uh, the whole psalm is messianic, Psalm 110. So it's obviously about Jesus. So it takes this event and turns it into a prophecy, again, reinforcing that typology is not our invention. Right? <laughs> psalm 110 does it with Melchizedek. Hebrews picks up many years later, and it says like Melchizedek shows up on the scene. First off, he's greater than Abraham because Abraham tithes to him. Well, Jesus is greater than Abraham. Second, he has no genealogy. He just shows up in Genesis, unlike most people, with no history. Um, some think he literally had no genealogy. I think it just means in the story he had no genealogy, so he would look more like Jesus. right? No father, no mother, no, no end of days. We don't know when Melchizedek died, yet in Genesis we have this repeated pattern. He lived, he died, he lived, he died, he died. Read Genesis 5, mm-hmm. he died, he died, he died. <laughs> um, Abraham dies. Joseph. We always stay with our main characters till they die, but Melchizedek shows up and then whew, he's gone. So he, so he, he, he's, uh, he's eternal, at least literarily, not literally. And Jesus is eternal, literally, you know, so you've got, um, you've got the bread and wine. I mean, this is communion, which represents the body and blood of Jesus Christ. He's giving it to Abraham because the one greater than Abraham will be the one who provides for all of us, his, his body and blood that we would know him. And so even his name, Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And the place where he is, the king is the king of priest. Uh, or the king of, of Salem, which means king of peace. Right? He's also a priest. So he's a king and a priest, which is most people, you can't do that, right? But Jesus is, the, is our king. He's also the priest. So, you know, Hebrews, I think it's chapter seven, goes through this in great detail. Um, like, dude, <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me love the Lord and appreciate and want to worship him. And, and to think that modern storytelling is based upon a lot of the same elements, except the difference is this. In modern storytelling, if you get, in fact, I'll give you an illustration. Um, there's a book series called Artemis Fowl. And I really like Artemis Fowl, the book yeah. series. I think it's fun. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, but they made it into a movie and it was like one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> and part of the reason for this, maybe not for a real little kid who wouldn't notice things, but, yeah. but the reason for this is because they, so I've heard it, they had to stop and start production and then bring in new people and do these rewrites. And they kept changing hands. You didn't have a visionary. You had too many visionaries. And then the story got all jumbled and they just eventually threw the footage together and released it uh, online, not in theaters, partly because of all this stuff that's gone on recently. But imagine this, the Bible has, has over 40 authors. Do you really think you're going to get this cohesive story? Over thousands <laughs> would, of years. It would be a disaster. It would be like Artemis Fowl or worse when you tried to do typology. <laughs> Because you'd be like plot hole, plot hole, inconsistency. Looks like they shifted originally. The, the, it was going to be Jesus was going to look like this, but then you get here now. He's totally changed. It just wouldn't work at all. Um, there is one visionary behind the scripture. It's God Almighty, and He actually used not just the writings of people through history, but the real three dimensional lives of individuals to paint a thousand pictures of His ultimate story of saving us through Jesus Christ. And I think it's an it's the most rewarding area of study in the Bible that I've ever done. That's you brought up so many good things in there. Especially, I love the analogy of him painting a picture or, or drawing a picture for us. It's like all this time, all the way back in Genesis, God's like, yeah. I I am so excited about this plan, and I need you to see it. So I'm going to show you about a hundred different times until it actually happens, and then oh, yeah. the fulfillment of that. It, that's just absolutely incredible, and. As, as well with um, the one you brought up about Abraham and Isaac, I think that is probably one of the things skeptics will point to and say, see, cruel God in the Old Testament. And instead, you, when you study typology and you apply that to that section of scripture, you flip it right on its head and you say, no, this is God showing us himself and his love for us. 
This is his compassion for mankind. This is not harsh, angry God. This is him drawing a picture for us to see because we have a hard time getting things sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, even things like the book of Leviticus, there's like, there's like, you know, five major sacrifices. And I have a video where I go through Leviticus, the sacrifices of Leviticus to find typology. And I think it's legitimate. I really do think it's legitimate typology. And there's times where I might, you might think I'm on a limb and I'll try to admit, I'll be like, look, this is conjecture here. Guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, consider this. I'm not going to offer a ton of confidence about it, but, but I think, yeah, I think in the, 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 the tabernacle itself, just the structure of the, of the tabernacle, you have, you know, God's throne or, or presence is in the very center of it yet the outside is covered with this like fur that looks ugly this really ugly fur so it looks lowly and very you know human so to speak on the outside but the inside is god like this is the, this is god clothed with humanity this is uh jesus it's god with us and and here is where sin is dealt with at the tabernacle right there's sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice but jesus he's the one sacrifice because all they're doing is telling the story of christ every day morning and evening every day as they do these sacrifices and it's Jesus who then says, now I'm going to cleanse you and you're going to be the temple. And it really what you get with, with, um, with the Old Testament without the New Testament is you get all of the symbols and none of the fulfillment. You know, but when you take them together, it, it's just, it's epic, it's beautiful, and it's worthy of, of, our, of our study and our time and our energy. Yeah, and, and it's for us. You know, like this is here for us. Each each moment of typology in the Old Testament, whether let's say it's about um, the judges and you have all these deliverers and Christ is the ultimate deliverer, the ultimate fulfillment of delivery from sin. Let's just let's just take that one thing. Each story is meant to show you a different facet of that overall thing, because you could just say it right out. Jesus is deliverer. But then when you look at the stories and you say, he's a deliverer like this, he's a deliverer like this, that brings so much more richness to the scripture. It makes you understand it so much better. The, the crucifixion with Abraham uh, Abraham and Isaac, you can see a father and his son and the relationship they have. You are then able to not look at uh, the father in Christ and say, these are cosmic beings. It's totally different. No, this is a father and son. And that's the relationship he outlined there. That brings a fullness to your understanding of it. That brings so much depth to the Bible that sure you you could, I'm, I'm not saying every single little thing is necessary for, for you to have salvation, mm-hmm. but do you not want richness in the things you're studying? Do you not want every bit that God meant for you to understand? That I mean, it's just such an important study. It's not just fanciful. It's not just interesting and, oh, I'll put a note on that. No, this is like actually very important because it gives you just this fullness to the Bible that you, you don't have otherwise. Christ is, is coming again. And so we have an opportunity right now to become types of Christ. Maybe we we don't do anything amazing where we are some point towards prophecy, but we in our lives can put on Christ. We in our lives can point people to him. Paul says, um, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what that's what we should be doing as well. It's it, it might not have the same um, literary amazement. We might not be some, you know, awesome character like David or anything like that. But man, Ephesians uh, 4 verse 20, and this is Uh, speaking of people living according to the way of the world, Paul says, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This, This last verse in 24, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Like this... This is what these people did, not even knowing who Jesus Christ was going to be. They didn't have that. Um, I mean, we don't know what they understood fully, but they didn't have everything that we have now with both the Old and the New Testament. And they were able to walk these lives, pointing us towards Jesus. And we can do the same thing right now for other people around us. I always like to go to that. I just think it's that makes it come alive for me. Honestly, my guy, that's really wonderful. That that whole idea that it's it's like you're saying, you know, here's. Anyway, I love the parallel you're making. Jesus is casting his shadow back in the Old Testament across all these different stories and all there are so many ways of representing him. And in a sense, from the New Testament towards us, he's casting himself forward 
except maybe it's the light and not the shadow this time. <laughs> and, he's, and he's casting himself forward, so to speak, into our lives to say, hey, you represent me to the world. You show me, you live a life that where they look at you and they go, I understand who Christ is because of, of you, the sacrifice, the love, the grace, the stance on righteousness and truth. Um, that's beautiful. That's a wonderful thought. Thank you all so much for joining us today on Truth Be Told. I'm Mikey Gunn speaking with Mike Winger. It has been an absolute pleasure. Today we've been discussing typology, and I hope that you have found this to be interesting and engaging, particularly typology of Christ is just so important. So I hope you add it to your study and continue to live more Christ-like as a practical application of this study. Until next time, continue to read your Bibles and continue to think critically about them. And Mike? And learn to think biblically about everything. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. All right. <laughs> if I have whet your appetite correctly, then you might want to check out the series on Jesus in the Old Testament that I've got tons of videos, tons of detail, and tons of blessings in it for you. God bless you.